World Pro Racing, where sim racing becomes real. Senna was a god, no one could even dream to follow him. I'm from a very humble background. The role of women at that time were really difficult. This is so dangerous. You are risking not only your life, but also my life.
World Pro Racing, where sim racing becomes real. Everyone likes to make out that this is such a difficult game, that this is very complicated and you have to use rocket science to work out where you need to be. You need to work out which X position you need compared to X driver and this place, that place, and all of the confusing thing that goes around with important racing. Today's the final round of the championship. Today is when we crown a winner. But for the first time in a little while, it couldn't be any more simpler. It is a case of whoever finishes higher than the other opponent in the race wins. We're tied on points. Taha Mali, Tinko van der Velde. There are a few players who are looking to try and spoil the party in the form of Luke Whitehead and Jack Noller. It's 16 points splitting four drivers. It's the Nürburgring. It is here with us. AMD GT4 Championship with us here at World Pro Racing Streaming Live, YouTube, Facebook Live, and Twitch. On top of that, we are with ESTV, the Esports Television Network. We are with TVM Sports, and we are with Motorsport. Dot TV to go along with that as well. My name's Jake Sperry. Well, Mr. Kieran McGinley alongside me for the ride. And well, it's a very interesting situation we find ourselves in here, Kieran. It's a case of, well, these four drivers up at the top, they have been podium setters. There hasn't been anybody really in this field who's really gone and been able to match them with the level that they've been able to get. But this is also a very simple case. It's a case of score more points than your opponent. Advantage technically to Van der Velde. Two race wins to one on countback. If it's non-scoring points between Mali and Van der Velde, Whitehead doesn't score, Nola doesn't score, then it's game on. It is game on, and it's always that last day of a championship feeling, isn't it? When you've got to try and work out, you've got to try and figure out the point scoring between one driver and another. Well, it's really easy for the top two. As you rightfully said, it's whoever scores the most points will win today. But it's not going to be that simple because you've got Luke Whitehead, who's six points behind. And then you've also got Jack Nolo with that outside chance. We say outside chance, 16 points off of the championship leaders coming into tonight's racing action. And with the points on offer for the race tonight, never say never. Anything could happen. But what will happen is it's going to be a close, close race. None of these four drivers have really finished lower than fifth place for the entire series so far. So I'm interested to see how things are going to develop at the Nürburgring. I am also going to be very, very alert to that. As you can see right now here, ladies and gentlemen, we are out there on track, keeping an eye out on some of the drivers who will be looking at their opportunities today, looking to try and capitalize over an hour's worth of racing. One mandatory pit stop required during the pit stop window, which will open at 25 minutes into this race and everyone is going to be pretty much on a tent hooked if you haven't had the chance to already you can like share and subscribe for more amazing content brought to you by the team here at world pro racing and if you have not had the chance to already you can head over to worldproracing.com forward slash event get yourself in on the sim racing buzz uh, championships going on here there and everywhere and i tell you what you definitely want to be around for the mix but as we zoom on into the circuit right now, using, of course, the Grand Prix layout of this wonderful Nürburgring circuit, a uh, small smattering of drivers here today. A little bit surprising to see uh, numbers a little bit down, but it does make life easier for those who know that they have got points in the bank. And going down to 13th, that's 13 points available if you do make it to the end of the race. So... That will also bring a few numbers in. Effectively, what we're looking at here is 17 points. That's how many Jack Nolan needs in fourth position. He's got 35 points for a win. And if he needs to get 17, it means that his rivals around him have got to finish either eighth place or lower. It'll be a little bit more different for Luke Whitehead, who would be allowed a leniency, uh, so to speak, of P4 or lower. That would be Jack Noller, who has the biggest outside shot to get the championship. That's how he would go in. Luke Whitehead, of course, six points back. If Luke Whitehead picks up a win, it's third or lower, and it will get the job done uh, if uh, Van der Velde and Taha Mali can neither of them find second position in the race so 
is a lot of variables here that we look at really, Kieran. But the one other variable that these drivers are keeping their eyes out on is, of course, practice and how good their cars are around cer certain circuits. Jack Noller looking the best of them all at this moment, and the Porsches looking pretty strong, it seems, one and two here in practice. At the moment, yeah, with uh, just, uh, just under five minutes elapsed of practice so far, and yeah, advances, advantage Porsches, as you say. It's uh, not surprising, really. The uh, the Porsches coming out on top of the Nürburgring, of all places, to to top the timing sheets. And of course, uh, our thoughts go out to everyone affected by the uh, the flooding uh, over in Germany and parts of Belgium as well. It's a it's a horrifying scenario. So hopefully, uh, if you are affected, uh, that you are safe and well. And we're seeing Max Vader now in the virtual drivers by TX3. Mercedes making his way now through in towards this, uh, well, I would say first chicane. It, it almost seems criminal to say, but that's the uh, Valve line and uh, Ford curve before we make our way. Power on down towards the Dunlop curve. You're always turning towards Dunlop here before you have to start putting on the anchors. And yeah. even then, you want to try and make it as straight as possible, that car. You certainly do, and this second half of the lap is just a climb up from the uh, lowest section of the circuit before you start really getting into it. The Michael Schumacher S, of course, a fast flick left and right, all about how much grip the tyres can hold on. And then you've got this Ravenel corner here, this very tough left-hander, 90 degrees, very easy to overextend through this section of road, and then you fall into Bill Stein, a corner which feels a lot longer than it actually is. And when you go and put the power down on the exit, you're always waiting, waiting, waiting. When you finally can, go up the hill through Ad Van Bogen and over towards the Vidal Chicane. This is going to be one of the places on the track where a lot of attention is going to be needed running that endurance-style chicane. It's a lot more open. It's a lot more uh, quick as you go on through here. And then finally, that Hyundai N-curve ends the lap then here on the Seto Corsa Competizione with Maximilian Vedi in that AMG Mercedes. The one of two AMG Mercedes that we see here today as points become very much a case of the offerings here today. But we also need to talk about something very, very important, and that is the prizes here today, Kieran. And of course, they don't just stop with the top three. They go all the way down to the top six. Really, really do. And uh, yes, our, our top three, of course, uh, win themselves the AMD Ryzen processors for the uh, top three overall. And then an added AMD goodie bag for fourth, fifth and sixth in the series. So one of these drivers battling away for the championship or for the top three is going to lose out. But they're going to be rewarded, all four of them, really, with a goodie bag at the very least, or at least a, a brand new shiny AMD processor. So it's all to play for between that top three. But these are racing drivers. They're not going to be happy with top three they'll want to win the series outright luke whitehead might be one of them he's in with a shout but he's six points off of the championship leaders coming into this race i mean i say six points that's uh if luke whitehead wins and nobody else finishes third or higher and that would be him as the series champion so it's all a lot of maths to do. We'll keep up to date as much as we can. We'll be glancing at the points here, there and everywhere just to make sure we're up to date with it. But yes, 30 po 35 points for the winner of the race. 30 points for second place. 26 for third in the standings. It's going to be one to watch throughout the entire series and what throughout the entire race. And what it might come down to is when you have your pit stop in the mandatory window. I'll tell you what will also be very interesting. It will be the battle that is going on for the top six at the moment. Simon Speth, fifth place in the championship on 73 points. Not here at this moment in time, which puts his position in a little bit of jeopardy. Jan Nicholas Erbrich is only two points back and should leapfrog up into P5. And Sheldon Muscat is there on 67 points. The nearest other challenger that is here today who has points is Maximilian Vady down 10th place in the championship on 60 points. So it's not a foregone conclusion, but we know that Vady has been an up and down style driver. He's had some really good results. He's also had some not really good results out there over the course of the season so far. And, you know, you look at where things are all pointing in this direction. A reduced field, I think, actually helps Maximilian Vady out here today more than it would do some of those rivals that he is racing against looking to get into that top six in the championship. 
it's going to help those that need the points. If there are fewer drivers to score the points, it kind of makes sense. But yes, they will be wanting to try and make sure they get take advantage of that and try and get themselves up the order. They only get those points if they make sure they get to the start finish line and take the checkered flag to finish the race. So they won't get those points if they don't. So it's going to be that real incentive to keep it on the tarmac, keep it away from the grass, and let's see if you can make the checkered flag and see what happens after the uh, the hour's worth of racing. We're seeing here Mercheka here in the uh, sole BMW in the field, making his way now up through the uh, Michelin, uh, sorry, the uh, Michael Schumacher S. The Michelin curve comes a little bit later on, but over the crest we go. And then finally you see some tarmac that's actually descending and falling away from you down it towards the Michelin curve now through this flying left-hander here. Want to put down the throttle, but you know, sacrifice the exit here to make sure you get the Vorsteiner. This is the most important one of that entire section through the third and final sector, really, because your momentum from here carries you all the way now through Ad Van Bergen and then up towards the NGK chicane. It's a slightly, as Jake said, more open chicane, but look at the bumps on entry here. The suspension has to work overtime to keep that car in check. Then through we go through the initial uh, left-hander through the NGK chicane. That suspension, again, working overtime to make sure that car's in check. You don't want to take that too aggressively, and you don't want to run a car that's just a little bit too stiff with the suspension. Otherwise, it's going to bite back. Macheka across the line, and currently 10th fastest in practice. Currently, at this point in time, some of the drivers are getting briefed at this moment on what they are expected to do and how they are expected to drive around this place. And it's starting to form quite nicely up at the top of the practice times with about four minutes to go. Jack Noller, 203.966, is currently the fastest. But you've now got yourself seven drivers all within half a second. Whitehead now up to second. Van der Velde now into third. And Itamai Yativ who is down in 22nd in the championship, has 17 points this season, has come out of nowhere, seemingly loving life in the Porsche right now. He's up there in P number four. Some drivers have one very good track in their repertoire, and I think this is the Itamar Yativ track. Yeah, Yativ and Vela, by the way, both on exactly the same lap time. I think it's a 204-111, both of them on exactly the same. So pretty much match for pace, you could say, at the moment, Yativ and Vela. But yes, Steve Vela, always a little one to watch there, always trying to make his way through the midfield. And you can see there that the fastest lap of this practice session so far, Jack Noller, has not set a single purple sector. He's got a very balanced car, is what that means. And he's the only driver so far into the two-minute threes. Yeah, and it's very telling as well to see that three different drivers who do not have the fastest overall lap have three different faster sectors. Van der Velde, fastest in sector one. Yativ is the quickest in sector two. And then it's Dean Vela, who is the fastest in sector number three. So ultimately, what you'd say is that this has a lot of opportunities and this is the sort of track which you would say for those machines which are a little bit better at keeping the car planted it would be a better circuit for you talk about the Janetta, the porsche of course has been pretty there or thereabouts all season seemingly comes alive around this circuit and then of course we've been keeping an eye on luke whitehead the only driver to go to the audi and I think the Audi as well has something around this place which maybe other machines don't have. Yeah, we were talking to Luke Whitehead all those weeks ago. It seems like an age ago since we last spoke to Luke Whitehead about the, the car. But he was expecting this Audi to be at its best here. He was sacrificing. He mentioned uh, Alton Park was another one where the, the Audi was just so, so strong at making it around the track and putting in those good, consistent lap times. And he feels quietly confident coming into the Nürburgring in trying to make sure that he gets the performance out of the car. But Tinko van der Velde now setting the fastest up in practice. Another driver now into the two minute threes is the uh, the Dutchman there in the Aston Martin, that number 66 car leading the way in practice. And that's really where van der Velde wants to be and needs to be because on count back at least, he's got the disadvantage against Taha Mali. If they both end on the same points, which they can't, it's pretty much impossible uh, unless they both don't finish. Then the advantage will be handed to Taha Mali because he's won two races compared to Tinker van der Velde's one. Well, if van der Velde wins the you. race... Oh, I no. will correct you because you do have them backwards. Van der Velde oh, with two no. wins, Mali oh. with one. Oh, right. Okay, okay. I I'm happy to be corrected as long as it's right. That's what I would say. So everything I said, just switch it around. Yeah. Good. 
Okay. All right. Good. Good. But anyway, okay. so so Tom Ali now uh, has to make sure if he wins the race, well, he's going to score more points than Luke White, uh, than Tigo van der Velde. Anyway, that's going to be a given. So he's going to win the series that way. But if they both don't score points, if somehow the top four don't score points, then it's advantage Tinko van der Velde. And van der Velde knows putting the car up in P1 is the best place to put it in terms of the racing that we have today. Because you can't be beaten if you're in position number one. It sounds so silly to say, but it's true. Nobody can outscore you if you're scoring the most points. So that will definitely be in the back of the mind for trying to make sure that this championship is under lock and key. And we really have to look at this as another case of van der Velde trying to showcase exactly what's there as we are into the final fringes of practice checkered flag about to come out in just a couple of moments here kieran because van der Velde has been on a really hot streak back to back wins round three round four into round five and you've got momentum on your side it makes life seem so easy i mean it just made it look easy kyle army and misano he just absolutely dominated didn't he he was at the front very comfortable with the pace, very comfortable with the car, got the pit stops right as well, and he's a man in great form. We haven't been racing here at the AMD GT4 Series for a while. We've had a little bit of a longer break than we expected. However, we are back. going to be putting ourselves into how will the title picture put itself into view the first i would say pieces of the jigsaw get put down in practice then we get all the way around the outline when it comes to qualifying and then we fill in the missing pieces to work out who is the winner when it comes to the race but with so few drivers out there this is a real opportunity here for everyone to go and get a good time very difficult with 13 drivers on the grid here, Kieran, to actually get your lap balked in any meaningful way, shape, or form. So there's a lot of emphasis on you do have two, maybe three laps to go and get the best time available on the board. In theory, yes, but motorsport's never decided on paper or in your head. It's always decided out there on track. And it would be, you know, that real kick in the teeth if you're the one that comes across one of the only cars out on track it's bound to happen to at least one driver in this qualifying session they've just got to keep their cool keep their composure and go again because as you said there are fewer cars out on track there's less traffic out on track try telling that to the uh, top three who are out there right now jack Noller leading the field there three of them have decided to take the uh, same bit of track together even though there's only 14 cars track position is going to be critical round here you've got quite a few heavy braking zones but more importantly you've got many mid-speed corners and if you're at the leader of that field you've got a good chance of making it through and just controlling the pace however you want as uh, jack nola dutifully takes out the cone at the very start of the session there going through the ngk chicane yes and now this gears up the opening opportunity to go for a lap let's go on board driver's eye perspective as we take the run towards the first corner of the Mercedes-Benz Arena. When you're running the Gisam Strecker layout, it's a Yokohama S, the right into the left. But on the brakes, you just take that descent down the hill, keep the power down as early as you possibly dare. And then you've got this very difficult off-camber turn number two. You've got to really turn in on the steering now before you get that small little dip down the hill, which allows you to brake slightly later into turn number three very easy to overshoot through here and then the 90 degree right to turn four which feels like it is so much more than that careful on the exit very easy to overextend through that period of time in the first sector already then will be classified as complete down the hill the next left and right very very difficult to negotiate the former valvoline and ford curves as you go through it's this next right where you've got to be really careful on the exit of course as the track levels out it's very easy for the rears to go around you then take a small lisking left before this carousel esque inspired corner here, the Dunlop curve. Back up then on the power. The next left and right is the Michael Schumacher S. This is a really crucial point of the lap. You can lose so much time not being able to go fully flat through that section. And then into Ravenol comes the next attack here. Very, very difficult left-hander and then you're finding yourself sliding into this next right always fighting for grip 
here at Bilstein. And then up the hill, you head now. It's over to Advan Bogan, this next right, which again settles the car down at fifth gear. And now you've got to try and work out where your braking point is at this chicane. 150 marker, 100 marker. There, just about 70 meters is the braking for the Porsche. And a whole heap of correction there as you go over the curb and in towards that Hyundai N curb. Jack Noller absolutely pushing with everything that he has got on this opening lap, knowing that Aston Martin behind a Van der Velde wants to go quick as well. That's a 203 966. In fact, he exactly matched what he did in practice, but Van der Velde goes at least a tenth, nearly two tenths clear. Nice lap there from Jack Noller, and he was fully on the attack then going through <laughs> towards the chicane. Great to see, right on the limit and no further as uh, Merceka now makes his way now through in towards the last chicane, the NGK chicane. Now on towards the final corner through the Hyundai curve. On towards then the start-finish line. Where can the BMW place himself on the order? The sole BMW in the field maybe getting a little bit of toe from the Mercedes ahead. It's seventh fastest with the 205 at 058. But as you said, Tinko van der Velde leading the way. Provisional pole position. It's Dean Vella who is less than half a, a, half a tenth off of that pole position time. Luke Whitehead in third place with Jack Noller in fourth. All the top four separated by two tenths of a second. Sheldon Muscat in fifth. Taha Mali though, four tenths off of provisional pole at the moment. We'll wait to see how that Janetta and how Taha can respond to this good lap time from Tinko van der Velde. Doesn't look like the Janetta really likes being here at this moment. Mali was down there sixth position in practice on top of that. But there is van der Velde in control of destiny at this moment in time making that charge up the hill one of the machines there on the left hand side in a little bit of trouble going through that might be saristo uh, there potentially who is just struggling a little bit then so uh, that's not quite ideal for the number nine alpine out there on track but van velde for the side max motorworks team is definitely going to try and do everything possible is going to try and move on up and get things all sorted that 66 machine well it is absolutely flying at this moment you can see just trying to get really aggressive over that curb through the penultimate corner and on the exit because you just want to maximize as much track as possible and this is the key to these laps that we're seeing here as jack noller goes fastest only for a brief stint because another tenth for tinko van der Velde brings it back into play whitehead crosses the line does improve on time but crucially not position yeah it's a great lap from jack noller unfortunately right behind it was tinko van der velde on a better lap and behind them is dean vela who now goes top of the standings 203 624 from dean vela puts him now in provisional pole position what about yativ then as he makes his way through the ng chicana now on towards the hyundai curve through this long right hander very tempting to get on the power early to try and Get yourself through the corner quicker. But patience is key. Here comes Yativ towards the line. Then can he make an improvement on his qualifying time? He can, but it wasn't a valid lap. It would have put him up into the top five. It would have done. So he's my Yativ. Still needs to find a bit more. Oscar Saristo and Kirsten Abeja are the only two who are yet to put a time down on the board here in this fifth round, final round of the championship. Vela on top. At uh, this moment in time would have been a shock to quite a few drivers out there over the course of today. But this is only going to mean that a jumbled up field is going to make life really, really entertaining. Saristo going through then the right and the left of this circuit and moving up then towards that final sector out on track. Breaking for the Ravenel corner here. This big left hander missed the apex slightly going through just out breaking there into that section of road and then for the next right again can't get it nice and neat there down to the inside as close as maybe is necessarily liked but you'd say for the moment Saristo just wants a time on the board that's the first thing that's the first thing isn't it you want to get your banker lap down then so you know what you've got to aim for and you know how you can try and improve sometimes you know drivers work better when they have a delta and they're and they're underneath it Sometimes it can unlock more and more lap time. Here comes Saristo then around the final corner and onwards in his Alpine towards the start finish line. Where can the number nine car place itself? It places itself in P number nine. 1.3 seconds off of provisional pole position.
Well, that's very apt. As about half a second to chase down the likes of Itamar Yativ, for example, at this moment in time, making uh, their way up towards the very, very nice NGK chicane here. And this left and right is all about attacking. That right has been the key that we've seen from a lot of these drivers so far. They want to be aggressive on the right, give themselves enough room to go out there to attack and show exactly what they're capable of. Yativ making a run then for it. And is this going to be any more improvement on this one? It is a 204.497 and does not change place. So not ideal there. So it'll be a reset back to pits and go out again. Already down to under six minutes worth of time at this moment. And Yannickus Erbrich surprisingly down the order in the McLaren. is down there in P12. This is a track that he's really struggling at. It is, and you, you saw then just going through the the, uh, the hairpin at the bottom of the hill that he ran deep and got into the gravel, and it's very difficult to run deep into the gravel there at Dunlop unless you miss your braking completely and you try and force the corner, try and force the steering wheel through, and then you just get a mountain of understeer. So, yeah, struggling at the moment is Jan Nicholas Ebert. We're not used to seeing him 1.6 seconds off of the pole position time, but let's see. We've still got just over five minutes of qualifying to go. The time is ticking by. The track temperature has gone down by a degree over the, uh, since the start of the practice session all that time ago. So we'll have to wait and see. Maybe the track might come to Jan Niklas Herbert over the course of this qualifying and maybe even the race. Yep, and that race is going to be important. If you haven't got it sorted out here, then lap after lap after lap, you've got to really manage it. You can see that big wide line was there for a moment trying to gear up for a lap it's just three hundredths of a second that split the top two in qualifying half a second splitting the top five at this moment as saristo looks to drive for the line and remains then in for uh, what is ninth position sorry there with a one sec a time one second slower than dean vela at the top and they've got to be really alert to how they find it there is the ninko racing car the estonian silver pmets is really going to be trying to find that time and find enough to gain what is at this stage two seconds yeah it's a tough ask but you know we know silver periods we know he's a quick driver and i'm sure that's not a representative lap time as he now makes his way out of uh, the vorsteiner curve and now through ad van bogen through he goes flat out through there even in these gt4 cars with the less aero than their gt3 counterparts now in towards the ngk chicane then trying to fly his way through then being careful on the curbs and then making his way through the hyundai curve through this long right hander getting a wider entry to maybe put the throttle down earlier not a bad shout as he makes his way towards the line is this going to be an improvement for the estonians he crosses the line it is an improvement in time but not an improvement in position and as you can see he's going for another lap Yep, another 1.3 seconds, though, still to be lopped off of the time. And there is the Ginetta of Taha Mali driving for the Ashtoir Racing Team. French-based outfit moving through then the left and the rights, which lead to the Mullenbacher Schleife portion of the circuit. And this is a case for Taha Mali of needing to find that pace, needing to find that objective. And the objective, you would say, above anything else, is just get up as high as possible for this qualifying. You don't want to leave yourself a lot of work to do in the race, especially as uh, I would say Persona Non Grata at this stage is in P2 for Taha Mali. So he's got work to do, but he also knows that there has been left margin so far in this qualifying with two minutes and a half and under. Yeah, don't forget as well, in the race, there is that mandatory pit stop. And of course, you'll have to have a tyre change. That is mandatory. You don't have to fuel up, but you'll find that drivers will fuel up during the pit stops. So it's all about when to put those fresh set of boots on to get you to the line. Meanwhile, then Taha Mali is making his way through the, towards the line. Here's Jack Noller almost getting sideways on the exit of the NGK Chicane. Now going through the Hyundai curve. Onwards then towards the start-finish line currently. 0.135 seconds off a of provisional pole position. Can he go quicker? Can he take back top spot? No, he can't. And he misses out by 0.015 seconds. Here comes Taha Mali then towards the line. Joint championship leader. Let's see what he can do then. Can he get higher than sixth place at this moment in time? No, he can't. And he'll have to go again. Time running out for Taha Mali to get himself off of the third row of the grid. 
Yes, and you've got drivers like Yativ and Vady who would desperately want to jump up onto the third row of the grid. Would be absolutely fantastic for them at this point in time as Yativ gets very aggressive through the first part. I wonder how much that compromised uh, the exit there of the NGK chicane, making that run. Sorry, the Vidal chicane making that run over towards that section of track there, that Hyundai N curve. And Yativ does improve, moves up then into seventh and crucially half a tenth behind Taha Mali at this stage. Whitehead now with a minute left on the clock needs to find two tenths of a second. It is getting mighty dicey up at the top between the Porsches and the Aston Martins. What can the Audi do? How do you do as Luke Whitehead finds his way through the final quarter and onwards then towards the start finish line? Can he get himself higher than fourth place right now as he crosses the line? Wow, exactly the same lap time as Tinko van der Velde. 203.657. We knew it was going to be close, but we're now matching lap times in qualifying. Crazy. We are matching times. Whitehead struggling a little bit as well with connection there. You could see through the final corner. Urbrick driving for the line improves. Jumps Aristo. Moves into ninth. That's a much better time then from the McLaren. And that will definitely help. They are allowed to finish the laps that they start. All bar a couple. Whitehead can't improve. So we'll stay no higher than P4. Van der Velde set time quick uh, first. So is ahead by that margin. Mali is down there in P7. At this moment, check a flag then out. And it's a case of who can find what. There's a big train over there at the Ravenel corner. But through Vidal goes Taha Mali. Looking to charge, looking to challenge here. And needing nearly six tenths of a second if it wants to be up there for pole. Nola's time is all but done. Will not improve on P2. Mali then crosses the line. Goes fifth fastest there. Found two tenths late in the day. Did the number 15. That is crucial to be back on the third row once again. You've got Yativ searching for a bit of time. Vela is out there as well. So there is always going to be opportunities there. The 14 is stopped out on circuit, so will not improve. Piermetz as well is searching for a bit of time on top of that. So Sheldon Muscat done. Question will be, will anybody find enough out there to get exactly what is needed? Piermetz goes P13. With that time, not bad at all. Yativ jumps up to P6 then. Four tenths off the pace with that one. And Van der Velde then cannot, I do believe, improve on this one potentially. So, who foresaw that one coming then, Kieran? It's Dean Vela on pole position. It's Dean Vela. I think that's his first pole position of the season. It's someone other than our top four protagonists on the front of the grid. Fantastic lap time from him. And to have the top four in that session separated by 0.033 seconds. Tells you all it's you need be, to know. Tell it's going to be mighty close. Mighty close. But all attention now as well will be on Taha Mali. He had a qualifying session where... In retrospect, three tenths of a second at other circuits is not actually the end of the world. But here, with the top four separated by less than half of a tenth of a second over one lap, two drivers matching each other's lap time, going to be mighty close. Tinko van der Velde knows that this is his chance to make up a couple of positions. Third place from him, I don't think, it is one time he's been off the podium, I think, and that was uh, the very first round of the GT4 series. Since then, he's been on the podium ever since, and he's coming off the back of two wins in a row. I might have just comment commentary cursed him, but we'll wait and see over the next hour how, how that gets on. We certainly will. We're going to step aside, though, for one moment here with World Pro Racing. We'll be back with the finale race after this.
and welcome back ladies and gentlemen to the amd gt4 series here with world pro racing wherever you are watching this right now you are in for a treat a surprise when it came to qualifying dean vela and jack Noller, the two gt omega rpm esport porsches then on the front row the main challenger for the championship in third his main protagonist behind who's tied on points with is in fifth whitehead separates them both there is an hour to work out who is going to be champion here of this championship and i'll tell you what the nurburgring is a fitting place for it 14 drivers one opportunity let's bring it right down it's showdown showtime as the green flag drops and we are underway here from this fabled nurburgring circuit they make the charge down towards turn number one and it remains too wide between the Porsches look how aggressive everyone's trying to be here as they run in Mally's gonna dive down the inside Whitehead's gonna try and send one around the outside as well it's gonna be important oh bang Nola contact with Van der Velde and Mally can scamper on away title in his hands at the moment Wow, wow, what a start, what a start. But, uh, well, I think Taha Mali will be pinching himself there because he's clearly got a car that might be okay in race pace. It might not be okay over one lap pace, but once that car gets warmed up, it looks to be like he's going to be prioritizing that but Dean Vella clean start from him his best position so far this season was the last round P12 he's currently leading this race certainly is and it's incredible there Saristo trying to get one done on Jack Nola who's been able to keep the car going how much damage though is the question there's more contact Merchieka tapping the back of Van der Velde not once but twice and a disaster for Van der Velde two times in a row he's won here in this series he's now been demoted right down to the back of the field that is a disaster opening lap one and it's on for the lead as well because Dean Vela has mirrors full of Luke Whitehead and remember if Whitehead can get that place on Vela and Vela holds off to Amali Whitehead's got championship aspirations yeah, and, and I'm telling you what, there's there's drawings, there's mats all over the place. And here goes Luke Whitehead up the inside, going through this long left-hander at the Michelin curve. Can he try and hold on there? As you see, Team Fella trying to hang on in there through the inside for the Vorsteiner. Very close indeed. Luke Whitehead should have the better run out of Vorsteiner. And now through Ad Van Bogen, and Luke Whitehead takes over the lead of the final round of the AMD GT4 series. Team Fella is not done with this one yet. He's looking for a way past going through the NGK chicane he's all over the back of the audi ahead of him can't find a way through d fella down to second luke whitehead your new race leader race leader and leader of the championship if things are to stay like this of course we still got 57 minutes to figure this out but it's a long way from here as we go picture in picture for you right now and see just how strong this is going to be Vela in second position. Mali in third. Whitehead leading this race outright. So they jam on the brakes. Vela very aggressive to the inside. Can't afford to be too aggressive because Mali now is going to get a really good run up the hill. And we know that Janetta works very well in acceleration, but just cannot work on the outside. There's a chance of a lunge down into turn number three. And here goes the lunge. Try and get through. Oh. Again, there's contact. This time it's Whitehead taken out by Mali. This is going to be huge for the stewards to have a look at this. Vela leads. Suddenly, Muscat's in second and fighting for that lead. And I tell you what, we are in for some penalties at this moment in time. And they could change pretty much everything. It'll shake up the order, that is for sure. What is for sure right now, though, Dean Vela now takes back the lead of this race. Sheldon Muscat now in second place. Both of these drivers really now... You know, if you'd have said at the end of or the mid part way, midway through lap two, Dean Vela would be leading, Sheldon Muscat in second place, I, I would be pinching myself. I am currently pinching myself, but it is happening right now. Vela leading Muscat. It is, and this is an incredible start to what has been an incredible race so far. We've got to keep our eyes out here on these penalties that are coming in. We've got to keep our eyes oh, out. Oh, and the checker contact there and it takes Maximilian Vady into the wall as well and that is huge as well for the top six battle that is going on at this point. Piermet's now up into ninth position and is dealing with Jack Nolla who wants to move up from tenth into ninth who sends it down the inside through the Bilstein curve and gets it done. Now look at this, Nolla and Van der Velde, they're both going to have to work incredibly hard to find those places back through the field. And this is going to be a long, long race where they are going to have to try and pick apart drives one at a time. But give credit, not looking back, there's the damage from Maximilian Vady. It looks very, very not nice, the bonnet. 
poking up, I'd say, at this point in time. It doesn't look like a happy car, that one. He's got to have that for the next 55 minutes and 39 seconds. Not an exciting prospect for Vaney, but let's hope he stays in this race because there's big points on offer, even if he finishes in P14. But the beginning of lap number three, Dean Vela still leads Sheldon Muscat to Hamali, currently in third place with Jan Niklas Ebrick in fourth. Luke Whitehead currently rounding off our top five. David Ohaka, we barely mentioned all the way through. He's currently in sixth place. Kirsten Abeya in seventh place. Itamar Yativ in eighth place. Jack Noller in ninth and Silver Pyramid rounds off our top 10 but Tinko van der Velde not far behind and not far outside of the top 10 you were saying how it's going to be a long race for our championship protagonists well it's going to be a long race for them in the sense they've got to get these moves done but that hour is going to fly by because when time works against you it really works against you oh it absolutely does and it's so easy to lose time in this sort of race you can feel like you, you're making okay progress but then suddenly half the clock's gone and uh, that's never an ideal situation now Sheldon Muscat here having to defend right now behind in second from Taha Mali to get two tenths of a second it's Mercedes uh, uh, yes Mercedes versus Janetta. now this is going to be an interesting one as now you've got uh, the two Aston Martins fighting Van der Velde looking eyes all over Piermet at this stage trying to get this one sorted and ultimately, at this moment in time, it's going to be a case of waiting once again. You can't necessarily make a move up the Schumacher race. You've got to be so brave to make that happen. Sit in, wait. You've got that next section of road, of course, up to uh, Ravenol, where is the real place you can go out there and attack if it should come to that. trying to have a move on the inside of Yitava Yativ then as they make their way through in towards the Advan Bogan. Again, side by side they go. Yativ will have the inside line, but he backed out of it. And Jack Noller now up into eighth place. An important move he needed to make. His next target now, Kirsten Abeja. Yeah, and Kirsten Abeja, of course, had a quiet start to this one in seventh position. There is Itama Yativ trying to get back at Jack Noller. Not going to get there. Van der Velde finally getting the move done as well in the Aston Martin. So another good opportunity done. If it stays as is, no penalties anywhere. Taha Mali is champion in third position at this point in time. Luke Whitehead back there in P5 will definitely want to try and get through as soon as possible. You can see Whitehead all over the back then of the McLaren of Jan Nicholas Erbrick, who just picked away through the landmines off the start of this race to move up into fourth. But you can see Whitehead looks really aggressive out of the corners, and I think he's got to run. Yeah, he might do. Coming now down, down in towards Valve line. He looks up the inside, but then has to back out of it. And this is Luke Whitehead, who in this series has not finished off the podium once so far. He's keen to keep that streak going. He's even more keen to make a way past Taha Mali. And they're both going to be sharing the same bit of track. If Whitehead can pass Erbrick, I wonder how round two is going to go because round one ended with Taha Mali making contact with Luke Whitehead. Here goes Jack Noller going through down in towards Dunlop and a relatively easy move. But Kirsten Abeya runs deep in towards Dunlop, then onto the gravel he goes. Thank you very much, says Yativ. Thank you very much, says Tinko van der Velde. That's a free position for the Dutchman there position you don't get too many of those in this series and that is going to be one very much taken with a little bit of happiness out there for van der Velde who's trying to get through now on for fourth oh, all over the place there was one mr luke whitehead desperately trying to get through and remember that hit to the rear as well how much damage is on that audi how much damage is on the janetta those are questions that are very much going to need to be asked at this point as sheldon muscat has to try and play defense here through the very, very tough chicane. Goes all the way to the inside. It's going to be a force around the outside. A little bit of contact as they go into turn for the corner then. So it's still going to have to be defended all the way. It's allowing Dean Vela. Then the gap at the front. Muscat playing the defensive card for GT Omega RPM. And now this run all the way down towards turn number one. Mali on the outside is going to have to be very brave on the brakes. Trying to get this one sorted. And ultimately, it's a case of can you put the power down on the outside? You can make it work. And again, Muscat tried to think about turning that. But ultimately, there wasn't a chance for that one all to work. So no dice at all. Now, here's something interesting. We're hearing that the incident between Nola and Mali is a racing incident then in the early goings. Abeja and Mershieka, it will be a 10-second penalty added for Kirsten Abeja then after lap two. Everything else we have seen is a racing incident 
and I don't think that's correct personally. Well, the decision's been made now, and the drivers will have to now move on. Yati, meanwhile, will want to try and find a way back past Tinko van der Velde. However, the Dutchman now, I mean, those drivers will be riled up now, that's for sure. Taha Mali has made the move on Sheldon Muscat off screen, and he now makes his way up into second place. 3.6 seconds behind Dean Vella now, getting back onto the power out of Dunlop. That's going to be a warning sign for Luke Whitehead. Now it's going to encourage him to get past these cars as quickly as he possibly can. If he's got any chance of winning this series, he needs to finish well ahead of Taha Mali, and now is the time we need to do it. Here's Erbrick having a look, just a sneaky look down the inside of Sheldon Muscat going in towards uh, the Michelin curve, then in towards Vos Steiner all over the back of that Mercedes. And Luke Whitehead will be looking to try and pick up the pieces, but he can't be too hesitant. He's not being hesitant at all, as he's now trying to go side by side with the McLaren going through Ad Van Bogen. Will they make it through? Yes, they will. Jan Nicholas Erbrick has the nose ahead, takes away the corner, and takes the line in towards the NGK chicane. Yeah, and uh, this is important then, so a little bit more battling to go on, and it's once more a case of Muscat holding the ground. Erbrick now will have to also hold that ground against the Audi at this moment in time, and it's going to be a question to be asked. Can you get through these places quickly and swiftly? This is all about just staying calm in this situation. We've got ourselves a good 49 minutes to go here in this one as they all dive in and very much a case of straightening out the steering there from Jan Nicholas Erbrick. He very nearly ran into the back of Muscat. Whitehead forcing a way around the outside trying to look for it. He's going to just run off the circuit slightly there and is not going to be able to find that overtake. So disaster striking at that moment in time. But ultimately, you can see how aggressive Luke Whitehead wants to be. He was all over that curb through four. He was, wasn't he? Trying to find a way through. Just trying to find any way through he possibly can. But it's great racing so far between the two of them. We'll have to wait and see how it all pans out as they now make their way through these uh, first couple of corners. Now making our way down towards the Dunlop curve. And riding on board then with Luke Whitehead. Picture in picture as we take our way down in towards the hairpin here. A little bit of banking there to try and help the cars carry a little bit more speed. I mean, more speed through a hairpin is a nightmare. But Luke Whitehead will try his very best to get past the McLaren. But we know Jan Niklas Erbrick is not an easy driver to get past. Especially if you put a curve onto oh, a wheel onto the curve and unsettle your own car. You're going to find it a little bit more difficult now heading in towards Ravenel. Yep, and now Luke Whitehead is finding out just how difficult this Audi can be to pilot. It is a, uh, I would say, a handful. It's like releasing an octopus into the car and trying to wrestle with it as you drive. It's a very, very tough machine to pilot at the best of times. And Luke Whitehead is one of the premier operators, you could say, in this field. Now, as they take that crest again, heading over towards that Vidal chicane and the left and the right, which once again proved to be a very important point in terms of this track to try and get correct. Battles go on as well up and down the order. This is Silva Piermetz having to play defense. Oscar Saristo there in the Alpine trying to find a way through, but ultimately not quite finding it. Not quite yet though. There's still plenty of chances for Saristo then. The Estonian to try and find his way, sorry, the uh, the Saristo car to try and find a way past Silva Piermetz then in that Ninko racing Aston Martin as they cross the start finish line to start their seventh tour of the circuit, breaking all the way down in towards the first quarter then. And the Alpine has to really run deep into, uh, into turn one there just to try and avoid the back of the Aston Martin. He did so, but that was mightily close. It was mightily close, but ultimately mightily close does not get the position done. So it will be another case of waiting then in this battle going on. Kirsten Abeja is in front as well, has that 10 second penalty. And uh, that is going to be one which you'd say uh, is going to be served at this stage, Kieran, in the pit stop. Yeah, normally that's going to be the case as Kirsten Abeja runs slightly deep then and almost catching the little bit of grass there, but managing to get away with it as they now run down the hill then towards the Dunlop curve uh, for another tour. Yeah, 10 seconds will be added to his pit stop. The, the team, or at least the virtual team, won't be able to work on the car for 10 seconds whilst the car is stationary. Then they'll be able to work on the car. So that'll be served quite rightly at his pit stop. Jan Nicholas Erbrick then still has the Audi of Luke Whitehead in his rear view mirrors as they now make their way onwards then towards Bill Stein. 
track falling away as you put the power down. But Luke Whitehead now back into the slipstream of the McLaren, of Jan Nicholas Erbrich now making our way through, through Ad Van Bogen. And onwards now towards the Vidal chicane. Let's see what can happen then. Up the hill they go then through this very shallow chicane. But it's very bumpy on the entry there. You can see Jan Nicholas Erbrich, the car, wanting to fight him there. He had to fight back. Going through then in towards the Hyundai end curve. Onwards then towards the start finish line. Let's see what can happen then. As the Audi gets into the slipstream. Luke Whitehead starting to fall away from the McLaren. Actually down the start finish straight. Is there going to be a move on down in towards turn one? I wonder. No, not quite yet. We're only a quarter of the way through this race. Luke Whitehead still knows he's got time on his side. Not much time, mind. But he's still got time on his side. Time on the side is very, very important. So uh, keep that in mind as this goes on. Luke Whitehead just wants to be patient here. But he can't be patient for too long. And that's why he dives down the inside. A little bit of contact as he makes the move through. A little bit of rubbing his racing then. And that is the position made. And Yannickus Erbrick did leave the door slightly ajar. He can't really complain about that then in terms of a move. Because he opened up the opportunity. And I would say he got caught napping. Did. He did, and that's not like Jan Nicholas Erbrich there to be caught out like that, but Luke Whitehead will take that position away and run away with it now, up into fourth place. His next target now, Sheldon Muscat. We know from previous series, we know from this series, Sheldon Muscat is not an easy driver to pass. No, definitely not. It's very much like trying to go through a thorn bush backwards, uh, really, you could say, <laughs> when you try and battle against Sheldon Muscat. No matter oh, which way you try and extricate yourself, it is going to be painful trying to make an overtake. And that much we saw earlier on with Taha Mali, who uh, had to try and get things going. Now, I'm just hearing drive-through penalty for Taha Mali on the incident with Luke Whitehead. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a huge one for the championship implications. That means it's going to put Luke Whitehead ahead. And Taha Mali, well, how far will he fall down with a drive-through penalty? It's going to be around 20 seconds, isn't it, in the pit lane once you've finally made your way through. But that's a visit to the pit lane he did not want. He just has to drive his car through at 60 kilometers per hour. It's a very, very slow speed when you're hearing all those engine notes go past you. He's going to fall down the field. You know, it's going to be tough for him to even stay in the top 10. It's going to be very tough indeed. And on top of that as well, that drive through penalty cannot be served as the only stop of the race. Mm. If you have a drive through penalty, you've got to take that, then take your stop. And that will move Taha Mali out of second position. And you also have to remember, it is a slow and laboring pit lane around this place. It is, it is, and it's 60 kilometers per hour, which at the best of times is slow. But when you're serving a penalty and when you're hearing those engines go past you, it hurts even more. So for Taha Mali, then, he's got to try and recover. Meanwhile, Kirsten Abey is having to hold off Oscar Saristo, then. I think he's been passed now by Silver Pyramid, and now having to try and hold off the Alpine as we make our way through the Mercedes Arena section now, down in towards the left-hander. And that Alpine looks very fighty at the moment. Kirsten Abea runs deep then, now back onto the uh, right-hander here, going back on, back onto the power. The Alpine is all over the back of this Porsche. Very much all over the back, but you've got to find a way through, and that's the key. Big braking zone coming up, of course, into that next left-hand bend. We're going to catch this on the replay, though. Here's what happened then with the incident that caused Taha Mali all of the trouble. Was on the outside, and you can see, was trying to get the move done on Dean Vela down the inside. But ultimately, out breaks himself into the corner, tags the back of Luke Whitehead going through. And that is why Taha Mali has a drive-through penalty. And this one, Abeja, big slide coming out of Dunlop Curve. Again, Saristo, just not in a position to attack. And you'd argue he doesn't really need to make this move because of the 10-second penalty Abeja has. I mean, you, t you try telling a driver that and they just will not listen to you whatsoever. They will just not have it as they now make their way up the hill and then in towards the, uh, the Ravenel curve. Oh, and Kirsten Abea runs very deep there. Meanwhile, Sheldon Muscat having to defend from Luke Whitehead then as we make our way now through the Vidal chicane and Sheldon Muscat somehow hangs on by his fingernails onto that third place. And Luke Whitehead running side by side through the Vidal chicane. I think Tahamani just come in yeah. to serve his drive-through penalty. He certainly has done. Abey has still continuing this battle. So keep this in mind. This is going to be a very, very tough one that they go through with. It will be a case then of Saristo trying to fight to the outside. And uh, it's going to be a tough one to work out whether you can be 
in position to attack in towards turn number one once again. And uh, I think they're going to come out right next to each other at this stage. Taha Mali still making his way down then the pits and he will be at the exit right now. So he's going to funnel out just behind this group actually at this moment in time and behind Mikhail Mershieka then in 13th. So it's going to be a long road back. Try and get this one all sorts for Taha Mali. P13 and probably it's going to need all of the pace in the world to get back into this one considering that you'd say Taha Mali's already about 15 seconds back of uh, the likes of Tinko van der Velde. But all four of the championship protagonists have all had something go wrong in this race. We've seen Luke Whitehead. He got turned around. We've also seen Tinko van der Velde have a, a, a been turned around. We've also seen Jack Noller get caught up in instance as well. So all of them have found some trouble. Taha Mali now has a drive through penalty. And arguably, you know, later on in the race, it's always going to be harder to recover with less time on the clock. But never rule out Taha Mali. Sheldon Muscat, though, meanwhile, is having to defend once again from Luke Whitehead. It puts Luke Whitehead then in pole position to win this series as it stands. We're not even halfway through the race yet. And Luke Whitehead already trying to battle away. Here goes then David Ohak on Jack Noller. In fact, that's the other way around. Jack Noller on David Ohak. He's made the move stick. He's now on to fifth place. That's a beautiful move from Jack Noller and he knew he had to make it quickly to not allow Van der Velde any chance to close down. Noller, remember, does have the outside shot of the championship but would very much like it if there are more troubles for Van der Velde and he can make his way up. Otherwise, he is just playing a supporting role. So Muscat then, still having to defend here from Luke Whitehead, who doesn't need to make this move for the championship, but it would give him more security. And look at the drive that the uh, Audi gets off of the exit of the final corner. It was almost like a half miss shift there from Sheldon Muscat. And that allows then Luke Whitehead to have the advantage on the brakes in towards turn one. He's on the outside, but by the way that this track falls away, can definitely hold that outside line but look at how Muscat tries to fight back here on the run to the off camber turn number two keeping the foot in with that Mercedes and now we'll have to do it again here at turn number three that's the tougher part and finally it is move secured almost here for the uh, Audi at this stage but it's all about drive off the exit and Muscat's got another good one but he had to check up slightly yeah, he did. You, you saw that there. He had to back out of that one. Now going in towards turns five and six then on the descent. And yeah, nice move from Luke Whitehead then. He knew where to position the car. He knew where the track was going to be at his advantage. And he was willing to sacrifice one corner so that he made sure he had the two outside lines and going through turns two and three where he had the upper hand. But fair play to Sheldon Muscat though. He made that difficult. Luke Whitehead now up into second place. He's 9.9 .9 seconds behind Dean Vella. We're less than three minutes away from that pit window opening. Let's see what the strategies are going to be like. There's Kirsten Abeya then, who's now got Taha Mali right in his rear view mirrors. Taha Mali will not want to be hanging around for too long as they descend down towards the eighth turn, in towards the Dunlop curve. No way through for Taha Mali this time around. Maybe on the exit, and Kirsten Abeya has been struggling with the Dunlop curve. David Ohak now is being closed in by Tinko van der Velde in that number 13 car. You can always spot David Ohak. He's got a nice livery to boot. Runs slightly deep then, and that's going to compromise his run through Bilstein. Now on towards the run through Advan. Surely Tinko van der Velde yep. will try a move. Surely indeed. It's a tough place to make a move. And there's some side-by-side -side as Mali gets around the outside then of Kirsten Abeja moves up into 12th. We understood that already with a 10 second penalty. Abeja is carrying towards the pit stop window, which opens, of course, in just under two minutes time. And from Luke Whitehead in second position at this moment in time. So a very important point in this race, an important one to keep in mind as things go through is that Dean Vela is right on it. Van der Velde down the inside. Contact as they go on the exit of turn number one. Ohak holding the place then at this stage in the Porsche and still Van der Velde searches. This time it will be at three. A lunge down the inside. And you know what? After that warning shot fired, I, I, even if I was David Ohak, I'd leave a lot of room. I'd leave a lot of room there as well. Tinko van der Velde flashing the lights. He clearly wasn't happy. And uh, David Ohak there, I think, gave him the line there for Tinko van der Velde. But Tinko now up into P6 in that side Max Motorworks car. He's got Jack Noller ahead of him now as he descends now all the way through in towards uh, turn seven. And then onwards then towards the Dunlop curve at turn eight. Really, 
anybody's game at the moment. But Luke Whitehead, you know, he's actually falling away from Dean Vella. Dean Vella's leading this race and extending the gap. Let me just remind you that the last round he had was his best result of the season so far. That was at Misano, and that was 12th place. He's currently leading here at the Nürburgring and extending his lead. Who said that Clark Kent solely uh, stuck to fighting crime because it's clear that Superman has just jumped into Dean Vella's car at this <laughs> moment in point, and there is no kryptonite here in sight. But for the likes of Luke Whitehead here, there will also be a little bit of a cause of concern at this moment. And it's not immediate in the form of Muscat and Urbrick. It will be Nola, it will be Vandervelder, because they are still somehow in this race within five seconds. Pit windows open, you can come in any time from now. Yes, you can for the next 10 minutes, but you have to make a pit stop and you have to make a tyre change. There is Marley then getting the move done. And Mikel Merchieka, as we now go through the long right-hander of Ad Van Bogen. And you see the BMW fancies the chance around the outside going in towards the Vido chicane. Not my cup of tea, but he's fancied it. But Taha Marley's now up into 11th place. His next target is the Alpine of Saris. So got a car into the pit lane there. I'm trying to figure out which one that is. Might be the Aston Martin and Piermetz. I'm not too sure at this stage. So uh, we'll have a little look. It is Silver Piermetz. So Piermetz, the first taker of anybody to dive down in and get a stop out of the way. And well, who can blame you at this point in time? It's been so hectic the first 25 minutes here of this race that, you know, take your chance to get a breather, get some clean air and have the race come back to you. Might not be uh, a bad strategy, nor is uh, the fact that you're 11 seconds out in front of the field if you're Dean Vela. You, that keeps you well out of trouble. It really, really does. And for Dean Vela, he had that moment at the start, but he just parted the Red Sea, managed to find his way through and make those positions up. He's had a little bit of luck with the championship protagonists coming together in the fact that, you know, we had to Hamali run into the back of Luke Whitehead, giving him that position back. But... It's not like he's wasted this opportunity. He has been flat out ever since and really stabilized that gap between himself and Luke Whitehead. The question is, when does he pit? Because when you're leading the race and you've got this mandatory stop, you're almost at the disadvantage because you, you can't react to anybody else. You're the only driver who can't react to anybody else in a good amount of time. So let's see what Team Vela does. Does he pit this lap or does he decide to stay out? I mean, at this point, Dean Vela can choose. And, and this is the reality of the situation. Vela just needs to find a gap. Uh, there's a little gap between Yatib and Soristo, you could say, at this point in time. And that would be ideal. But uh, Vela, at this moment in time, choosing to stay out. And the longer that he stays out, the more likely he will find a gap out there on circuits. So that will also be playing in the back of the mind. Taha Mali all over the back of Oscar Saristo at this point in time. We said it was a gap 11 seconds up to Itamar Yatim. Well, that's the 11 seconds that Taha Mali's now got to try and eat into in the latter stages of the race. Jack Nola takes the decision then to come down into the pits. Wants an advantage on the tyres all over the kerbs there. Goes Taha Mali. A little bit too aggressive. So aggressive. In fact, oh. oh, my goodness me. He just went full deer leap as he went over there trying to get into the pit. Well, I wonder, I wonder if they've briefed on how late you can actually call to go into your pit box there or into the pit window, into the pit lane. Because, oh, well, it was, it was a show-off move. It was a deer leaping through there. But, yeah, not the safest way. But he's now into the pit lane to serve his mandatory stop. He's already been there once, of course, with that drive-through penalty. But, of course, as you rightfully said, Jake, that doesn't count as a mandatory visit to the pit lane. You have to make a stop and you have to change your tyres. Shadow Muscat, though, currently in third place. He's been very consistent just inside the top ten. He's got two P8, a P7 and a P9. He would love to round off this season with a podium. Well, why wouldn't he? at this point this would be an incredible result and performance if this can be all pulled off so we'll keep this in mind as they continue on forward and figure out where they need to be the uh, 36 machine is off of the jacks and away with a whole boatload of fresh air and that 36 here this is going to be crucial to keep in mind at this point probably going to send the chain reaction through the train here for Urbrick, for muscat for whitehead because that will be positions that one driver will definitely be trying to get. And let's not forget as well that the driver in fifth position on the road, the 66. I want to go and have a look at the 66 machine and especially the front of that 66 machine of Tinko van der Velde because he is not getting, he's losing. Why? Well, you see all that damage on the front. That would probably be why. 
That would give you a good indication as to why he's not quite closing in. And in fact, not losing a little bit of time to Jan Nicolas Erbrick as well, as you said. So, yeah, that side Max Motorworks car, it's been in the walls. It's clear it's been in the walls. But it's now making its way in towards the pit lane to serve the mandatory stop. Just over five minutes of the pit window left open. And as long as you make your way to that pit lane speed limit line, you cross in and register in the pit stops. You could pit with one second to go and make it to that line. And your pit stop will still be within the window. So Van der Velde into the pits then. Mandatory tyre change. You can do whatever you like with the fuel. Although, if you've run a heavy car this far... I, I, uh, I don't know if anybody would have. That's what I would say to that. Yeah, that's going to be very crucial. Now, what's also crucial is the fact that both Van der Velde and Whitehead, who both pitted at the same time, came into their boxes at exactly the same time as well. So keep that in perspective and also keep in perspective where Van der Velde is in comparison. We saw Whitehead was second position overall in terms of when he came in for that stop. Second position is 30 points. And it is a seven-point swing to fourth position, which is 23 points. The gap at the top of the championship is six points. That would be crucial. So for what is going to be the challenge for Tinko van der Velde, he's got to get to P3. Meanwhile, Dean Vela out in front, 13.2 seconds clear of teammate Sheldon Muscat. There in second position, cresting the rise once again through Ad Van Bogen and over towards another lap. We are over halfway through this race. Dean Vela has been in control for the majority of this one since the two Ashtoir drivers of Whitehead and Mali uh, came together there in that battle. But Vela on the brakes takes the first stop then and the only stop we'd hope here, Kieran, of this race. That we'd hope, yes. Let's not let's not go about jinxing it just about now as he makes his way in towards the pit lane then. I mean, he's had a fantastic first in, hasn't he? Sheldon Muscat coming into the pits as well as Jan Nicholas Erbrick both into the pit lane now. So he won't have to worry about losing a position to Muscat or Erbrick so long as he gets that good, good stop. We've heard from a couple of drivers this season that pit stops have been a little bit of a cause of concern. Some drivers have overrun the box and lost about 10 to 15 seconds. Others... You know, they've had their issues with tyre pressures, not selecting the right tyre pressure, making sure the setup's okay. There's been a whole range of reasons why it could go wrong in the pit lane. Make sure you've got everything set up and hopefully it all goes okay. Hopefully is what everyone is keeping on. So now the only driver staying out is Oscar Saristo, who will get a little bit of camera time in the front of this race in the Alpine at this moment. So... Saristo doing everything that is necessary in the number nine just to keep the car on the island, score some solid points, move up in the championship towards the end. It's going to be something definitely worth keeping in mind as this one all goes through. Vela already has the stop done. You can tell by the fact that the one on the timing tower has turned green for go. Do not need to make any more mandatory stops over the course of the racing, but... Where will everyone else come out in comparison? We know that Van der Velde is behind Jack Noller at this point to the two to two and a half seconds. Whitehead, though, did really well on the stop. Gained five seconds. So that is Luke Whitehead, who is effectively third position on the road right now and gained a pretty sizable gap compared to everybody else. He did, didn't he? That's a, that's a good gap that Luke Whitehead's now got that down to as he makes his way all the way through. Of course, the uh, the timing screens will update once we reach a, a timing line. However, he is currently in third place. And let's see. I mean, yeah, you're right. He took about five seconds out of that gap. I'd love to know what it is once we get to the timing line and once it all shuffles about. Sorry, so we'll have to pit this lap. He, it's not possible for him to complete another lap and not uh, come into the pit lane there as he makes his way now onwards towards the uh, the Ad Van Bogen out of Bilstein. This will be the lap he has to pit in, but he'll have enjoyed this lap in the lead, that's for sure. Never take that away from him. He led a lap of this race. Yeah, so uh, that's always going to be good. Erbrick here. Mirrors full of Jack Noller making the run up towards the Schumacher S. So through the left and right, they come along, and it's this charge up the hill, which Jack Noller is hoping that he can get the move done on. Erbrick then in the McLaren, having to defend on that inside and covers the line off at the earliest available opportunity to make sure there was no way through. But again, 
It's about set up a more narrow line in and Noah gives him a full force tap on the back saying I want to go through here. But the key to this in terms of this battle right now is look at where Tinko van der Velde is. He's only 2.2 seconds back. If Erbrick holds his train up, van der Velde sees championship in light. So he can get by both of these drivers in front. He will indeed. And that's going to be on his mind, the forefront on his mind then as Jan Niklas Erbrick makes his way around the final corner at the Hyundai N curve, back onto the power he will go. But how good was his exit? He's got to try and defend. He's got to try and see if he can keep Jack Noller back then. Down the start for this straight, we will go. How about Tinko van der Velde? Yeah, I think he's just losing a little bit of time on the straights then. With that damage, he's not going to be closing it at the rate of knots he was beforehand. But it stays line of stern for now. Erbrick, Noller and van der Velde, third, fourth and fifth. Well, pit, uh, pit Road is now closed officially at this stage. And don't count Taha Mali out of everything. Macek is trying to get back against the Janetta. You can see there's a huge size differentiation between them. Saristo comes right out of the pits in the middle of this. Four to the dance, why don't we? Here as they head in towards the early stages. That's Silver Piermetz trying to find a way through against Saristo here as they make that run on. And again, it's not quite there. And a little check up from Mali who had no room to go through and attack on the brakes again they go into the next section of road turn three of the mercedes benz arena and it is a move done and that's one position gone and here is going to be two bit of contact there on the exit there for mali who has to skirt across the grass and the checker trying to get aggressive as well trying to find a line two tires on the grass almost three wide in towards that next section of road bit of contact there between mercheka and saristo but mali somehow surviving and is going to pick one up on the exit as well on piermet I mean, Marley's managed to negotiate that brilliantly. I, I'm, I'm not sure how he did that because Mercheka, for the longest time, looked like he was going to win that game of chicken. He might win again here down in towards turn eight and up the inside it will go at the Dunlop curve. And Saristo, who's only just emerged from the pit lane, he was ahead of this crowd at eight corners ago. Now he's the fourth car in this train. Yeah, and just like that, that's how easy it goes. But look at this up the hill. You've got Erbrick, you've got Nola, you've got Tinko van der Velde trying to get up into fourth position. Muscat struggled in the pit stop. That is why there is such a difference out there at this stage. Why Van der Velde has been allowed that opportunity to attack. So it has just started to fall away from Muscat. We didn't quite see why, but now this front stretch, Jack Noller here, really hoping to get through, really hoping to find this one. Erbrick here, weaving here, there and everywhere, trying to shake them off at this stage. But Van der Velde will have a chance to break late on the inside. He's not quite available to do that, but has 23 minutes to figure out the two moves that gets him back to Title Town. Yeah, Title Town is within arm's distance. It's within reach, and it's held right now by Jan Niklas Erbrecht, that position, that key to get in. But Jack Noller is not going to be an easy man to pass. He's proven time and time again this series. He's a very, very consistent driver and he can pick up the pieces when he needs to. He can get those positions when he needs to as we make our way now down in towards turns five and six before we make our way towards that long turn seven. Van der Velde still on the back of Jack Noller. Back onto the power we go out of, uh, out of six and now through this slight kink of seven down towards turn eight we will go. And now seeing where Jack Noller can emerge, then he's still not close enough. But I mean, you've, when you've got Tinko van der Velde breathing down your neck, I'd struggle at the best of times, let alone with, when you're trying to get the position ahead as well. Well, now here's another thing that's going to be interesting. Luke Whitehead has a gap of 4.2 seconds to chase down to Dean Vela. We saw it was 11 seconds before the stop. I think Vela's had a pretty long stop and that's why the gap has shrunk at the front. But there is Piermet still dealing with Merchek up in towards the Dunlop curve, the carousel-esque inspired corner. Three car battle still continuing. Mali breaking away in ninth, but his championship gone up pretty much in smoke. Look at that. Rule 101 of the Sim Racers handbook. Use lights if you have them to try and make some things happen. Here comes Tinko van der Velde again to the outside trying to get the move done. But again, not as so good on the brakes in that Porsche. 
Yeah, he's so, so good. And he's so confident on the brakes. But here comes Tinker van der Velde up the inside in towards a Hyundai N-curve. He's got the inside line. He'll be able to get back onto the power quicker. And he does get that position away from Jack Nuller. It's not finished there, though, yet. Because look at this Porsche now closing in to the back of the Aston Martin. We know that Aston Martin is wounded. Here is Merceca looking for an inside move up towards the last chicane. In through we go. And Silver Pimis just about holding on. He gets a clout on the curve, though. Merceca now sticks a nose up the inside going in towards the Hyundai curve as we make our way through then this battle for 10th place back onto the power both drivers will go the Aston Martin lighting up the rear tires and now Saristo fancies his chances passed as well he'll get a bit of toe will he no he can't find that way through just yet Silver Pyramid's hanging on but that Alpine is not hanging about now switches to the inside line going down in towards the first turn who's going to be later on the break it's going to be so close between them but it's Linus Stern and Merceca Pyramid and Saristo Linus Stern indeed as is the battle going on the third, fourth, and fifth. The money move on the outside looking here there for just a brief moment and will continue is Tinko van der Velde. The McLaren versus the wounded Aston Martin as they hit the brakes, go in towards the Dunlop curve. And again, it is Jan Nicholas Urbrich doing enough holding that stationary at the moment. The licks of flame, of course, coming out of the back of the McLaren will be interesting to see as well. And Van der Velde, you can see, has that anticipation, wants to get through, wants to get that place, wants to get that championship winning position and would lead the championship by two points there or thereabouts over Luke Whitehead if they were to stay with that working. Wide goes Noller in the background, lifting some of that pressure. All of this battling, meanwhile, oh, as there's a bump to the back from Van der Velde, is bringing Sheldon Muscat in, and that will be the last thing that Van der Velde wants. It'll be the last thing he wants and the last thing he needs. He needs to keep those mistakes down to a minimum. If not that, zero mistakes whatsoever. He needs to find the way past Jan Nicholas Erwin. He can't win the series in fourth place with Luke Whitehead in second. It's not possible. He needs to really finish in the top three for that to take effect. Of course, now making our way through that long, long right hander at the Hyundai N curve. Now into the slipstream, Tinko van der Velde will go. You see now Jan Niklas Erwin trying to do everything he can to give the toe the least amount of benefit possible. Coming down the start finish straight now down towards turn one. It's worked this time around. Of course, you are allowed to make one move and then one move back to the racing line. It's just that Jan Niklas Erwin is doing it so early. He is. It's an incredibly early as well because it's happening in the phase of acceleration. You move to accelerate and get in the line and by the time that you've got there, it's the fact that you're back on that racing line. Once again, you have to correct yourself and you don't have that power to attack. That McLaren is so good in the straight line in comparison to the Aston Martin. So when you've got the advantage of you can defend on the straight line, the only thing you've got to do is make sure you've got enough of a gap into the corners. And that is what we are seeing here from Jan Nicholas Erbrick. It's the middle sector where it's the most likely to fall foul. Look at uh, Sheldon Muscat booking his way onto the battle for third place now. Just hanging about at the moment. He's closing up though with all this battling. He's still with the chance of a podium. He was in those podium positions, but he had a bad pit stop, we assume, because he rejoined well, well down the order, well below where we expected him to rejoin. Tico van der Velde turning up the wick then on the back of Jan Nicholas Erbrick, not for the first time this race. Still can't find a way through as we make our way now through the Michael Schumacher S. Back onto the power we go then after a small lift on towards Ravenel and Bill Stein. Still no way through for Tinko van der Velde. He's got a few laps to try and assess what he's going to do. How he's going to try and get past this McLaren ahead of him. Through in towards Bill Stein we go. Back onto the power then. Using that curve on the left hand side too. Still sticking in the toe. Just one eye on the car ahead. One eye on that screen. Just to let you know where Jack Noller is in all of this. And you see that McLaren pulling away on the run up towards the Vidal chicane. That is incredible. And I tell you what. To have a car that is so good in straight line, like Jan Nicholas Urbrix is, it makes it so tough for Tinko van der Velde to go and make something happen. You can see he's tucked up underneath. You're going to see this move right now, trying to go over to that inside. He's not got enough room to cover. There's no move just yet. Now he goes and makes it all the way to the pit wall, trying to cover this off. Urbrix wants a podium this season. This would do him a world of good. But you're up against what is effectively the championship leader coming into this final round. And again, it is covered off and defended here in the opening stages by Jan Nicholas Erbrich. He's got to be so alert now in towards turn number three because this will be an attack from Tinko van der Velde. Thought about it on the inside, covered every stage of the way by Erbrich, who knows where to place that McLaren. It's the widest McLaren in all of Germany. 
Correct indeed, but a small bit of a mistake then. He got a little bit of oversteer going through turn four there, did Erbrick, and that allowed Tinker van der Velde to close in again. It, well, it checked him up, and that's also brought Jack Noller into the mix once again as we now descend our way now through in through turn six, and then back on the power we will go. Tinker van der Velde still right on the back of that McLaren as we make our way towards the Dunlop curve down towards the hairpin. It's not really an overtaking opportunity unless you've got the line and you're confident on the brakes. Not this time for Tinko van der Velde. You can see then the Porsche right on his diffuser as we make our way back onto the power up towards the Michael Schumacher S. And this is where you have to be on your feet here. You've got to, if you're Tinko van der Velde, get the move ahead. But you've also got to be wary of that screen of Jack Noller behind and looking for a move here. Looking for a move. He's going to make sure that van der Velde has to defend this one in towards Ravenol and suddenly a gap opens up and it'll be another lap here where the Aston Martin can't get by the McLaren of Jan Nicholas Erbrick. Whitehead stable with the gap to Dean Veller at four and a half seconds and there is no catching those front two at this stage as they are 20 laps through this wonderful wonderful race 15 minutes on the clock we're into the final quarter of this race and talk about being clutch when you need to be this is a case of well you go into those drills and you hope that you've got exactly what's needed trying to set up that big run out of the exit of the corner is van der Velde but once more with Jack Noller there with Urbrick holding that advantage up there in front van der Velde stuck and this is the most frustrating bit as a driver when you're stuck yeah, well, for the next 15 minutes, Tinker van der Velde, these will fly by as he struggles to try and get past. For Jan Nicholas Erbrick, this next 15... Oh, oh we, got, we got contact! Lasari so finds his way through. That Was was that Merchecker and uh, Pyramids there making contact? Well, Pyramids definitely speared off to the left-hand side. We didn't catch all of it, but what we did see was two vehicles going off in separate directions, so we might just have to go back and keep an eye out on a move like that. It looks like Pyramids is one of them who has fallen into troubles then with that one and has dropped all the way back into 13th position then after that sort of hit. So not ideal in the circumstances, but Jack Noller we focus on here in P5. Look again, middle sector. Tinko van der Velde, so much more adept, so much more able. So here's the replay then. So this is Soristo versus Piermet up the hill. You've got Maximilian Vady just behind on top of that. And as they hit the brakes and go into this big right, two into one, that doesn't go. Yeah, that's a math equation that's really easy to figure out there. But when you're racing, he's just trying to find the corner there. It looked like one of them clouded the curb, and that just sent them into the other car. And so that caused all of that ruckus. Meanwhile, then Jack Noller just trying to find a way past Tinker van der Velde. He might have found an opportunity then coming in towards Ravenel, but no way through. And that's actually causing Tinker van der Velde to lose a bit of momentum. He's having now to defend from Jack Noller. Now he's losing ground to Jan Nicholas Erbrick right ahead of him. Now this is a chance for Jack Noller to get back past the Aston Martin. Well, Jack Noller knows he's got nothing left to fight for except for places, and he still thinks there's a podium, but he's got to get by if he wants to try and get onto that podium. He wants to consolidate place. Muscat there behind as well. This is a really interesting battle, and you have to start asking the question here for Tinko van der Velde. Is this going to be one where you are attacking or you're defending? Because you are stuck in the middle of this sandwich, and Schrodinger's overtake says you must attack and defend at the same time. And this is what van der Velde has to do. He's got to find a way to get by Erbrick and not leave the door open to Jack Noller behind him. It's a tough, tough scenario there, that is for sure. But Tinko van der Velde knows that he has to finish third. He has to. Yeah, this scenario, this will not be enough to hold on to the championship lead. If it were to finish like this, in 12 minutes and 10 seconds time, Luke Whitehead wins the series. This is now or never for Tinko van der Velde. 12 minutes to go. Jan Nicholas Erbrick has done a fantastic job of defending here. He's been the cork in the bottle here. But Tinko van der Velde just cannot find a way through. We know that Aston Martin is slightly wounded, especially down the straights here. It just cannot keep up with the McLaren, even with the slipstream. He can't keep up down in towards the Dunlop curve. So Jan Nicholas Erbrick knows what he needs to do because what he's been doing for the last 10 minutes has worked a treat so far it has but once again it's a case of that Schumacher S coming up and it doesn't make life too easy for van der Velde because once the full power is down 
he can't get alongside through this section. You can see again the Royal Grunt, the McLaren, just pulling away ever so slightly. A half a tenth here, a half a tenth there. It's doing a good job. Now set up the run, but again, it's going to be defended here by Jan Niklas Erbrick into this section. Why try to find some form of traction? is Tinko van der Velde, and that brings Jack Noller back into the party. And all of a sudden, for Jan Niklas Erbrick, from what was defending for a couple corners, just having to place the car in the right position, he's got it all sorted again. He now knows the chicane again. This is where van der Velde is really good, can carry more speed than the McLaren. But again, it's another braking zone, covered on the inside. There's not enough run to go and make the move. And van der Velde here, again, on the front stretch, well, he's not got enough pace. He's not going to get there into one. You, you'll see here, Tinker van der Velde, these moves will become a bit more desperate. They'll become a bit more forceful. They'll be, I should just go for it now rather than hang back. I should try a, a move later and try and see if I can find a move down the inside. It's not a hint of desperation yet, but he knows time's against him. He knows he's struggling to get past Jan Nicholas Erbrick, and he probably knows once he can get past, he might have a chance of building a gap. Then, of course, though, is the McLaren in a straight line. It's quicker than the Aston Martin. He's got to pick his moment. He has to find a way past. Maybe on the exit of turn four, he might be able to get a run through here, but he clouts the curb and all that momentum he had built there through turns three and four, he's instantly lost and instantly lost it to the car behind Jack Noller. Yeah, and Jack Noller will not sniff a second opportunity. Those two came together at turn one on this race. Ultimately, it sent Jack Noller flying back through the field to about ninth place. Van der Velde had a second spin down there, of course, with Merceca. That was down at turn number seven on circuit. And ultimately, it sent all the way to the back of the field, Tinko van der Velde. The way he's fought back to fourth position has been magnificent. We consider that Taha Mali had a drive-through penalty, that Luke Whitehead has been ever the calm driver in second position, managing his own race. But it is Jan Nicholas Erbrick, which is proving to be the toughest cookie to crumble in this entire race. And you now start to sense it here from Tinko van der Velde. If we can get it over the line in third, it is his. But he's got to pick up that run. And that is the best run that he has had all race long to try and pick it up. But again, Erbrick's got enough to defend it. And he'll use all of the road. He'll cover on the inside. It's single line through here at the Vidal chicane. And again, what do you do if you think of Van der Velde set up the run for the exit? You've got to try something here and it's covered on the inside. So far, so good. But you see that McLaren there might get a compromised run coming out of Hyundai end curve, but he's got the straight line speed. He might not have the acceleration that the Aston Martin does, but at the top end, that McLaren is pulling away. And once again, he has to be careful from Jack Noller behind him, heading away once again down towards turn one. Still no way through for that side. Max Motorworks Aston Martin right now. Jan Nicholas Herbert holding on, but he doesn't get a good run out of turn one there, having to defend now in towards the Mercedes arena through two turn two we go then towards turn three a little bit of a tap from Tinko van der Velde down in towards turn four again Erbrick goes defensive as uh, sorry we're going to turn three now now through into turn four a little bit of a mistake there van der Velde will try and take advantage of that but he doesn't get the same run he had last time out before he clouded the curb and once again he is stuck behind that McLaren seven minutes 50 seconds to go van der Velde's time is running out it certainly is, and now you've got those two hungry, swarming behind like vultures. Jack Noller, Sheldon Muscat, they're thinking more than top five, top six. They are thinking podium, one position for the podium. Another little look into the mirrors from Tinko van der Velde. He's trying to force every mistake he can out of Jan Nicholas Erbrick, who we've been focusing on predominantly for 15 minutes. It's the closest battle on circuit. There are no other battles within a second and a half, if not two seconds out here on this track right now. And again, Jan Nicholas Erbrick is proving why the McLaren has been top dollar for 299, which didn't look like it was going to qualify well here today, of course, here, uh, Kieran, but has certainly proven race pace. It can hold its own as again to the outside searching goes van der Velde. Yeah, Erbrick, best finish so far this season, sixth place. And now he's got a chance of a podium on his hands as he now makes his way through in towards the Ad Van Vogen, and now on towards the Vidal chicane once again.
Jackson Kerr, but he runs a little bit deep there. A little bit oh. of a tap as well to the McLaren behind. That'll unsettle the McLaren as we head our way down towards the start finish straight. This is a chance for Jack Noller to fancy his chances to throw his hat into the ring, to throw his cap amongst the pigeons. He will now try and move now down in towards turn one. He'll go to the outside. Here comes Sean Muscat though, looking for a move up inside. Still a little bit too far back. Jack Noller trying to sweep his way round the outside in towards turn one. Didn't work this time, but he's ever alert. Almost, almost had that chance on the Aston Martin, but the side Max Motorworks car managed to recover well. There's four laps to go here at the Nürburgring, and that costed about a couple corners for one Mr. Tinko van der Velde. He can't afford to make contact. He can't afford to let the stewards get involved with this championship battle as he tries to get by Jan Nicholas Erbrick. He's got to make a clean pass. He's got to make a fair pass here in this one. He has no help from Dean Vella in the front who leads this one. Remember, he hasn't had a result like 12th place so far in this race. But now you start to wonder here for the 299 machine. How long can you defend like this? How long can you hold on? You know you can see the time just ticking away, lap upon lap. You tick them off corner by corner. And again, it's another good run off of the exit, which is just allowing that McLaren to just gain as much as possible. This is frustrating for Van der Velde. And every tap to the back is another case of impatience. And it's another case of, I've got to find something from somewhere in the final five minutes. I mean, you, you take into fact as well of qualifying that Yannick Cerberic qualified just inside of the top 10. I think he qualified ninth in the end, but he was within a second of the pole position time. This is what the second can do. You can't find your way past and you cannot make the move stick so far for Tinko van der Velde. That's been the case. It's a case of frustration for the Dutchman here as Yannick Cerberic once again makes his way through the Vidal chicane. A little bit of an, uh, you know, a run there that might cost him because here comes van der Velde once again. Has to go round the outside and he'll try and pick up the toe he'll try and pick up the accelerator a little bit early but that's allowed Jack Noller to go side by side it allows him as well to take the toe of the McLaren up oh. ahead but you see Tinko van der Velde got the squeeze out there that's Jack Noller who had to back out of that one let off the throttle slightly there again he has to go round the long way in towards turn one the track might fall in his favor but the track position certainly won't well, you talk about track generals out there on circuit. You didn't see anyone more track general there than Tinko van der Velde. Know your place, soldier. This is my battle for the championship. Do not get involved in my battle. And van der Velde now really aggressive coming out there of the Mercedes-Benz Arena. Looking once again for chances here on Jan Nicholas Erbrick. But again, this isn't the place you can make a move. That next left-hander, he's got to set this one up. He's got to work it out. He's been there for 20 minutes, stuck behind Jan Nicholas Erbrick, and he's got to work it out. Otherwise, his championship fades and dissipates. It does, it does, and it's dissipating with every second that goes past. Flash of the lights from Tinko van der Velde. If he wasn't in business before, he's in business now. He knows, he can see Luke Whitehead in second place. He knows how valuable that third place will be. And we have around 180 seconds before the chequered flag will fall. Tinko van der Velde here knows it's not long to go before that chequered flag. It's not long to make a move. But here comes Jack Noller once again, looking for a move around the outside. They go door to door now, going in towards Ravenel, but no room left for Jack Noller as he makes his way now onto the approach towards Bilstein. That's more time lost for Tinko van der Velde. It's the last thing he wanted. No, especially with two laps to go as he crosses. This is a case where Jack Noller is being a pest and a very, very difficult pest because he gets a really good run and van der Velde has to defend now here in towards the Vido chicane. This is falling apart for van der Velde because he couldn't get the move done. Again, he defends this time into the final corner. If that gap extends out any more than it does right now, van der Velde's got no shot here of reaching third place. He's got no shot of the championship that way. Jack Noller is single-handedly shaping the fate of this championship when he knows he is completely out of it by points. Again, he searches here towards turn number one. Again, he'll look to the outside. But again, that gap now is a second. 
might get a switch back here out of one and now in towards the Mercedes arena in towards turn two he's now got the outside line but he decides to tuck back in and Sheldon Musker has to leave him the room there now gets a little bit of a switch back going in towards turn three he's got the inside line has he got track position no he runs a little bit too deep then and loses momentum now in towards turn four Tico van der Velde holds on but Jack Noller might get a little bit of momentum out of four as we head our way towards turn five he's certainly looking for a move then in towards turn five he might have to go the long oh. way around through in towards turn five now on the descent now towards turn six he's got the inside line can he stick it with him through the inside no he can't van der Velde just about holds on but look at that now the gap between Erbrick and van der Velde one second one second lost just in that battle I'd say more 1.5 and that is pretty much a call of I would say agony for one Mr. Tinko van der Velde. He knows what he's capable of doing. It will have to be a lap of the gods to chase down Jan Nicholas Urbrick here and make something happen. We were talking about a second in terms of qualifying pace. If van der Velde still got that pace, he'll go out there, he'll use it, he'll try and get it back, but he still has to be mirrors occupied here of Jack Noller. The last lap starts then for Dean Vela at the front of this field in the number 54 GT Omega RPM Esports Porsche. He surprised everyone by taking pole position here today, but he's proven that Porsche, this is their ground that they want to mark themselves down on here in the GT4 category of class. They look really, really strong. Vela kept it out of trouble when all the title protagonists around him did find that trouble and ultimately that's why he's got a lead of 5.4 seconds over Luke Whitehead in position number two. The gap between Erbrick and Van der Velde is down under a second again. So this is crucial for Van der Velde. He's only going to get one chance on this final lap if he closes at a rate of four tenths of a second on this lap and that will be up at the final corner. This is not over. The championship comes down to the final lap of the race. The timer has expired here with World Pro Racing. It all comes down to whether Tinko van der Velde can drag a wounded Aston Martin by the McLaren of Jan Erbrick. And this is what racing's all about. Nola pushing wide there through turn number four. And all of a sudden, the Sidemax Motorworks needs to be in full force. And that gap visibly looks like it's coming down. Muscat looks like he's got off the road slightly there in the background. And that now keeps him very much resolutely in position number six. But look at that gap. It was nine tenths of a second. You'll get the sector time here from nine tenths. It's down to seven tenths. So he only took two tenths then in the opening sector. But this middle sector, he'll be able to attack and he'll be able to look really strong. He's looked so good through the high speed as Tinko van der Velde, especially through this sector section of road up the Advan Bogan corner goes Dean Vela do not take any credit away from him he has driven a fantastic race so far here tonight and you know what it doesn't matter if your best result is 12th position this was well worth it for a season Dean Vela will round the final corner and will take the victory in the number 54 Porsche Luke Whitehead behind him will be in second and for just a few moments is champion as things stand, as he makes his way to the line and picks up the marble. Now it's Erbrick versus Van der Velde, but Van der Velde cannot catch that gap unless Erbrick outbreaks himself here into the final corner. That is all they wrote. Luke Whitehead is your champion. Yeah, Nicholas Erbrick has just proven that he has made the most staunchest of defenses to deny Van der Velde the title. Shades of Vitaly Petrov against Fernando Alonso, but fair play to Jan Nicholas Erbrick. He did a stunning job of keeping Tinko van der Velde behind, and it has decided this championship. Luke Whitehead is the series winner by my calculations by three points. It all came down to the last race. It was a cork in a bottle, but who cares? A fantastic race there. Dean Vela also picking up the race win. Here comes Mikhail, uh, Mikhail Merchieka to grab 10th place off of Vady there as they both cross the line then to finish off their races and their series here at the AMD GT4 series. There is your race winner. Previous best result at the last round was 12th place. He comes to the Nürburgring at the finale to win the race and... Once it's confirmed, we'll have a look at the series winner as well, which we've calculated it before any penalties need to be applied, which we're not aware of. Luke Whitehead will be 
the series winner. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, wow indeed. The difference then in the championship as it finishes. Just the one point splitting Luke Whitehead then and Tinko van der Velde. <laughs> as we figure everything all out. Just some incredible championship battling. And this is what the Nürburgring does. You bring yourself into some close battles. You bring yourself into some good close battles. And you look at it really here, Kieran, and you say, you know, this is a track where you need to be calm, keep yourself out of trouble. That was a case of everyone got in trouble in some way, shape or form. Luke Whitehead was probably the calmest driver today to bury themselves, or sorry, to dig themselves out of a buried grave. Yeah, and I think as well, going into turn three it was, when he got the tap from Taha Mali that sent him around. When you look back at it, he only lost a couple of positions in that entire, you know, tirade there. So he managed to get back on it. You know, we're not sure how much damage he had to the rear of that car. It, you know, he, he started to then fall away from Dean Vela towards the ending stint, but I think he was just race managing at that point. He got the second place. He's got the series by our calculations, yet to be confirmed by the, uh, the race stewards as well, by the official results. But... Yeah, a fantastic race, a fantastic series for him as well. Commiserations as well to uh, Tinko van der Velde and Taha Mali, as well as Jack Noller, who I thought put in a stunning race as well. I thought he did. He had to recover very well, and uh, that was a good job. We are going to get drivers trickling in. And first and foremost, Jan Nicholas Erbrick joins us right now. Third position overall here in this one. Uh, Jan, um, I I'm not sure you quite understand just how much of a an effort that you put in. Uh, in terms of those final 25 minutes or so, because you were defending with everything you had and a bit more, and it was enough today for the podium. It was so hard. <laughs> I can't speak. It was so hard. These 25 minutes, uh, these guys were so much faster than uh, I was, but yeah, the McLaren has uh, yeah, the good thing that it is fast on the straights. Uh, that really helped me. Otherwise, I think they would have just <laughs> dri drive by, by me, drive past me. Um, yeah, but oh, this one, it was just too close. It was just too close. Very much uh, the case in point. Uh, how much do you um, do you look at that battle, thinking of that podium, thinking about how important it would be for you to make sure that you rubber stamp this season off with a really strong result? And then when everything is considered and you get yourself into that position, do you realize just how much of an influence you had on that championship? there in hindsight yeah i just realized it after the race that uh tinko had i think he was first uh before before the start of the champ uh, of the race uh yeah but i was just i just wanted to have fun yeah <laughs> there was almost nothing on the line for me so i just wanted some nice battles and uh, yeah to fight to fight with these amazing guys these guys are probably some of the best uh guys on assetto corsa I mean, nothing on the line is maybe a little bit of an understatement. You do finish inside the top six in the, uh, I believe, fifth position here in this championship. So ultimately for you, you're getting yourself an AMD goodie bag. So uh, how do you uh, how, how do you uh, go and celebrate yourself getting yourself, by our calculations, fifth in the championship? Well, uh, I've got, got a new university exam tomorrow. So oh. the best thing is I, I'm going to sleep and uh, read a bit about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Just uh, smiling, just, uh, drinking something, <laughs> uh, water. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, thanks to all of you guys for this uh, championship. It was really, really fun. Uh, although the McLaren was, yeah, really, really hard to drive. The brakes just don't want to work sometimes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was was definitely fun. Yeah, it definitely was for you. Jan Nicholas Erbrick there, third place overall. Uh, Kieran, I believe you have managed to get the chance to uh, find our race winner, that being Dean Vella. I have indeed. Dean, talk to us because your last, be well, your best finish in that series so far was 12th place. You you've just come to the Nürburgring, absolutely smashed it and won the race. What's your secret? How did you find <laughs> that race? Uh, to be quite honest, I expected myself to be a bit more competitive this round, but Definitely did not expect to finish first with like matching matching the the pace of, of Whitehead. So honestly, I think it's just the setup all season long. I just couldn't get a hold of the car. Uh, then this round, I tried to put a bit more effort in setting up, getting help from my teammates, and yeah, it did pay off in the end. 
Yeah, and talk us through that, that those first couple of laps because they were very hectic and, and you managed to keep your own nose clean. How did that have an effect on the rest of the race for you? Yeah, I mean, I was very lucky for one. I mean, I think uh, my teammate Jack um, got punted in the first corner, I, I believe, if I recall correctly. Uh, and then there was an incident between Whitehead and uh, Tinko, I think. Yeah, it definitely made things a bit more easy. Uh, still, I had to push every lap to try and create a gap, which at the end kind of saved me because uh, in the pit stops, uh, I think I overshot it in the stop and like lost five seconds to Whitehead. So that definitely helped. So it was a bit easier, but still pretty tough to manage everything throughout the race. I'll bet it was. But once you got into that second stint there, I mean, you lost a bit of time in the pit lane. Can you talk us through that one? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's always like this when I go in the pits. I just overshot it a lot and I just I, I can't get the grasp of, you know, getting a, the perfect pit. So I do have to work on it. It was like one of those breaking too late and kind of losing it there. Absolutely. Well, uh, congratulations on your win here. You left it till the last round to get your win, but a huge congratulations to you. The floor is yours, uh, Dean, for any shout outs, any sponsors you'd like to thank. Uh, yeah, firstly, my team, of course, RPM Esports, along with all my teammates. And secondly, of course, all the sponsors. So GT Omega Racing, HyperX, uh, Gaming Malt, and of course, World Pro Racing. Well, hopefully, Dean, you haven't got a university exam tomorrow and you can celebrate properly. We'll leave you to it now. Congratulations on your victory today. Thank you. Good night. And I think Jake has, our, by our calculations, our series winner. Jake? Yeah, I've just got to double check here. I'm sure, yes, by 1.143 to 142 points. Luke Whitehead is your champion with a second place finish uh, here today. Luke, first and foremost, that would have been a very, uh, I would say, up and down race uh, by your standards. It was one where uh, you had to fight pretty early on, especially from lap two onwards when you got a little bit of help from that Janetta uh, trying to make the move for second. I mean, as if Nürburgring itself as a track isn't enough of a good roller coaster already. Um, oof, I'm still trying to process what just happened. Um, yeah, I mean, qualifying enough in itself was astonishing. I mean, I think me and Tinko drew, I think we were exactly the same time to the thousandth and we were only three hundredths off pole. So that was incredibly close. And then obviously, as you say, at the start, I think Tinko and Jack tagged each other. I think it was just unfortunate. Um, you know, going through that corner, it's always going to be difficult when you're all so clustered up. And then, yeah, lap two was scary, I'll be honest. Um, because, you know, obviously I took the lead and I had the pace at the start. So the pace was really good. Um, and I think I showed that throughout the race. And, you know, to get that spin was very frustrating. But my head was just, I want to win this championship. You know, I haven't won a championship yet. I want to win this one. Um, you know, in the car, I wasn't in the strongest car this season and I wanted to do it. So, you know, I dug deep, pushed as hard as I possibly can, got past Jan Niklas, you know, with a little bit of a touch. So I apologize for that. But, you know, it was the only opportunity I was going to get. That thing's a missile and I had a bit of damage, which was also dragging me down the straights. But I can't complain. I honestly can't believe the outcome, to be honest. Well, let's just talk about how you got there through the season because uh, we were seeing these results. You had a third place to start things off quite nicely. On top of that, then you go, you get that big victory at Alton Park in the changeable conditions. And then it's just been a case of consistency. You know, three third places, a second and a first. Uh, you haven't been off the podium all season. You've been by far and away the most consistent driver. Uh, has that level of consistency and now finding that consistency of speed how much has that really helped you to develop your skills as a driver and move forward to take this championship? Oh, uh, I can't understate it. You know, um, consistency is extremely important. I think, you know, people, I've seen championships before where people have finished second in every race and they've won the championship, you know, haven't won a single race. So, you know, I knew that just keeping out of trouble would pay dividends and it did in the end. Um, and, you know, that's just been me doing a lot of racing recently i've been doing a lot of sro esports a lot of sim grid stuff and been up the front winning stuff in that as well so i've learned a lot over the past two weeks and you know i went through a tough stint i went through about three four weeks of just awfulness you know turmoil and you know came back through and i think i'm probably stronger than what i was um you know I've, the last four races i've done i've been p1 p2 p3 and like p10 you know, so it's been, I've been right up there and it's been coming a while, so I, I couldn't be happier. Absolutely. And well, of course,
title is yours. Uh, two questions. One, how are you celebrating? And two, how much will you have Jan Niklas Erbrich to thank for it? <laughs> well, he certainly didn't make my job easy at all. Um, I was stuck behind him for, I think, about 15 minutes. So <laughs> I, I, um, I'll thank him a little bit, but also give him a slap around the back of the head. <laughs> so, you know, he could have made it easier. But yeah, he drove a brilliant race. You know, well done to him. Well done to Dean as well. Um, regards to celebrations, um, probably have a drink of orange juice, to be honest, or water. Um, definitely water. <laughs> because, you know, I, um, I'm very, very drained after that one. My room has got to be about 60 odd degrees in excess right now. So, yeah, <laughs> just relaxation, to be honest. Well, the chance for you to cool off is now. Before we let you go, shout out sponsors. Anyone you'd like to thank, it's Title Town for Luke Whitehead. So first off, I'd like to say a massive thank you to the guys at World Pro Racing, Justin Mifford, uh, Nathan as well. Um, obviously, Justin Figu uh, Justin Figuello, Adrian Figuello, sorry, and Justin Mifford. Um, and you, you too, Jake and Kieran, for your amazing commentary all season. You know, you the this championship has been brilliant. I've thoroughly, I've thoroughly enjoyed it, even through the ups and downs. So, you know, massive thanks to all you guys. Uh, massive well done to Tinko and I believe, I, I don't know who came third. Was it Jack or Taha? You know, well done. Yeah, well done to both of those two. You know, they put up a really good fight. Um, you know, pushed, re pushed us all really hard throughout the season. Um, finally, a massive thank you to SDL Esports, uh, Kevin Leon, uh, Red One Misaud, um, Hamada Rakizi as well. Those guys have been enormously helpful uh, in the past few weeks, you know, getting me involved in the big races to put myself out there and really, really progress myself. So those guys have been fundamental to my success tonight. Well, the progression is there to see Luke Whitehead gets the championship then after a wonderfully strong drive. And well, Kieran, there are winners in championships. Unfortunately, when there's a winner in a championship, there also has to be a loser. A brutal way uh, to uh, end the season for Tinko van der Velde. He's stood by with you right now. Yes, he is indeed. Tinko, I mean, commiserations, first of all. You put up a fantastic show and uh, we certainly enjoyed that battle for that last podium position. I mean, talk us through it because that race had a little bit of everything for you, but for all the wrong reasons. Uh, no, guys, yeah, that uh, that race was so tiring, took a lot of energy because, like, I didn't have that good of qualifying. I think I could have been easily on pole, but I just couldn't get the lap in. Uh, but still, I was in front of my championship rival and uh, and Luke, so that was great. Um, I just wanted to take it easy on the start, but then I don't know what happened. I think, uh, yeah, I got touched from the rear and then I hit uh, Nuller and that was just so unfortunate for both of us. I lost so much time and then I had a little spin as well with the uh, incident with the BMW. So I ended up in, I think, last position. And with 10 seconds of damage, so I I was so mad after that. <laughs> but uh, I knew I just uh, needed to stay calm and push as much as I could, and that's what I did. Um, so then I had a great recovery drive. But in the pit stop, uh, I went a bit too far and lost like 3 seconds, so that was really a shame, because I think I would have been in front of the McLaren. <laughs> and now I got behind the McLaren, which was not good, because he holded me up for like 25 minutes or something, which was, uh, yeah, not fun for me. I hope it was a good fun watch, at least, for you guys. Uh, but yeah, not fun for me. I tried everything, but it was literally impossible. I could have dive bombed him maybe, but that's also too risky, so I didn't want to do that. Well played to him, he did a great defending, and uh, yeah, that race was was really good, but also really bad because I lost out by one point on the championship. Yeah, and it was, uh, uh, you know, really decided on that last lap as well. You, you gave it everything, as you said, for 25 minutes and uh, you just didn't get the result you wanted. But Tinko, looking back on this entire season, I mean, you've had two wins. You've also finished in the top three. You lost out by a point, sorry to rub it in, but you do get yourself the uh, the AMD Ryzen processor as a top prize for the top three. Is, is that something to sweeten the blow of it? Also, how competitive this season has been, that the top three separated by seven points? Yeah, apart from this race, I I really enjoyed the season. It was so much fun having the championship fight and in the last round being on literally the same points. It, it was so amazing and I had amazing battles. Um, my P3 on Autumn Park, I'm just really happy with that because Aston is really bad there. 
so that was really good. But in the first race, uh, I got before after a crash as well, which was not my fault. So that's I could have had an easy podium there. So that's also really unfortunate. And a crash today as well, which I could not f do nothing about. So I think looking back, this should have been my championship. But I'm still happy, of course, with P2 and of course a processor, which is really nice. It's gonna help me. And uh, yeah, I'm overall really glad it was a really fun championship. And yeah. Well, thank you, Tico. Uh, just a quick shout out. Any sponsors you'd like to thank? Uh, yeah, of course, AMD for everything, for sponsoring for the processors. Uh, you guys uh, always amazing commentating and hosting these events. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, and my team site, Max Motorworks, uh, has had a little rough time the last few days. Uh, we've stepped down as an uh, esports team, but. We still try to race a bit for them, and that's what I want to do. So, uh, yeah, I wish them good luck, and yeah, I'm really happy about this championship. It was fun. Well, thank you, Tinko, for talking to us. Congratulations on P2 in the championship. I'm sure we'll see you at World Pro Racing very, very soon. And Jake, I, I hand that back to you. I think we've exhausted all of our interviewees. I think they're exhausted already. I think we are as well. That was that was an incredible last race of a season, which has been uh, predictably unpredictable, I think is the right way to put it. And just an element of what is fantastic here with us at World Pro Racing. There's some great stuff coming up on the horizon as well. We've got the Open Series, the HyperX Open Series. That goes on every single month. Make sure you check that out. That is next Friday, ladies and gentlemen, next Friday. But before that, of course, we have got ourselves that beautiful beautiful official gt3 championship it is the malta national gt3 championship opening round is going to be coming up into full view on saturday make sure that you check that out same time same place on top of that so a massive thanks has to go to everybody who's helped get it done today to world pro racing of course who have been putting all of this together from Adrian Fagayo and George Muscat, the Chief Stewards, Justin and Nathan Mifsud, who have been on the cameras here today. From everywhere that we have been streaming, of course, YouTube, Facebook Live, we've been on Twitch, we've been, of course, with ESTV, the Esports Television Network. We have been with Motorsport.tv, and we have, of course, been with TVM Sport. From Kira McGinley and myself, Jake Sperry, five rounds, ten weeks. Incredible absolutely incredible you cannot ask for a better championship it was close when we started this one it was even closer some may argue by the time we finished it all off it all came down to one overtake and one overtake that couldn't quite materialize but a championship did for luke whitehead the long road to a dream finish of a championship has come fully full circle welcome to the winner's circle welcome to world pro racing this is where sim racing becomes real, ladies and gentlemen. And you'll want to see more real sim racing coming up in the not too distant future. World Pro Racing, where sim racing becomes real.
Senna was a god. No one could even dream to follow him. I'm from a very humble background. The role of women at that time were really difficult. This is so dangerous. You are risking not only your life, but also my life. World Pro Racing, where sim racing becomes real.